Hello and welcome to this, the first EACS webinar ever. With more and more educational activity, more vascular physicians and limited funds and time to bring people together, the use of digital opportunities now also allow ESVS to bring education to everyone interested. Whether this in the future will be limited to ESVS members or, as today, will be open to everybody is something we will look into after the first three webinars, one today, one in November and one early next year. The title of our webinar today is Remaining Controversies After or Despite Recent Guidelines. In 2018, ESVS published the new carotid and vertebral artery guidelines. We have four subjects we would like to cover. So the format of this webinar will be so that each topic is presented by one of our two experts, followed immediately by a discussion. And the topics are relevance of timing of intervention, local anesthesia is superior to general anesthesia, intraoperative completion studies reduce the risk of procedural uh, further, and finally, uh, physiological mechanisms of procedural stroke. So with me today, I have Professor Henning Eckstein from Munich and Professor Gerd de Borst from Utrecht. They are both recognized experts in carotid disease management. Before we begin, I would like to thank our executive sponsor, Biopharmaceuticals, for an unrestricted grant to perform and transmit this webinar to you all. If you are watching from your computer, notice the live chat in the bottom of the screen. You can use this to uh, interact with us during uh, the whole procedure. Thank you. And now I'd like to hand over to Gerd de Bosch to speak about the timing of carotid intervention. Please, Gerd. Thank you, Henrik. Timing of intervention. Sometimes it seems that we are used to this already for a long time, to treat our patients as much as possible within two weeks. But I put on this first slide of the old, the previous carotid guidelines uh, published in 2009, actually showing you the difference between the ESVS guidelines and the American counterpart by the SVS, where the ESVS had already uptaken a recommendation on timing to do this within two weeks. Well, the Americans had not just uh, opt uptaken a recommendation yet. So in 2009, this was quite new and the data where the recommendation was based on was also quite new, published in 2008, based on this CETC recalculation from the NESET, ECST and the Veterans Affairs trials. This table shows you the absolute risk reduction conferred by CEA in the five-year cumulative risk of ipsilateral stroke for both the 50 to 69% stenosis and the higher degree over 70% stenosis. And this table is split out for the timing. And as you can see, when there's longer delay in your intervention from the uh, event, the number needed to treat, to treat NNT goes up. So this suggests that the earlier you treat, the more strokes you can prevent. However, and we are talking about remaining controversies uh, after the guidelines, you can see that this table was created from time since randomization and not from time since the event. And I come back to that later on in this presentation. So why is this so? Why is it relevant to perform your uh, intervention quite early after the event? Well, as you probably all well know, this is mostly because the event rate after the first event for a recurrent event is quite high and much higher than previously estimated. In the past, it was believed that this was around 5% maybe at one month, but it has been shown to be even up to 17% within the first 72 hours. This is also reflected in this graph with the arrow pointing at the two weeks threshold and showing that this difference exists actually both for patients that had a minor stroke and also patients that had a TIA as the primary event. 
both patients with TIA and with minor stroke have the highest rate of recurrent events in the very early days after the very first event. So this is clearly uh, the period in, uh, where we as interventionists can uh, treat our patients and try to prevent these further strokes. So this brings us to the most recent guideline. This was uh, published online in 2017 and in print in 2018 and available for all of you uh, free from access. And this recommendation um, scored as a class 1A recommendation actually then also states that in symptomatic patients with a over 50% high degree stenosis, it is recommended to perform the intervention as soon as possible and preferably within 14 days of onset. So the old school timing criteria of the risk for second uh, severe stroke can go to the garbage because we now know that the uh, risk is actually very high in the very early days. But how about the uh, risk of early surgery? Because there will also be some papers that suggest that the risk of early intervention is high. There are some papers in the literature um, uh, dealing with this uh, question. This is the group from uh, New York by Karen Rockman, also showing a decline in operative risk when you delay your intervention uh, for one month or longer, and also showing the highest risk uh, here on the left of 7.5% uh, stroke and death when you perform your intervention in the first week. And there's more data also on the risk of early stenting, this time uh, from Philvok et al, uh, actually showing that the risk of early surgery seems relatively acceptable and low when you perform your intervention in the very early days, while the risk of stenting here in the black bullets seem to be especially high when performed in the very early days. And based on this study and others, the ESVS guideline therefore recommended another 1A recommendation that when you perform your intervention within 14 days of symptoms, the patient should undergo carotid enterotrectomy rather than stenting. There's more data on this, and that's based on a uh, collaborate between the European trials comparing surgery with stenting. And this shows exactly the same type of data and outcomes, where the outcomes of surgery seem quite acceptable with outcomes of stroke and death around 3%, while the data and outcome of stenting are quite high and astonishing 9% when performed in the very early days after the event. So this is important data. But so what is new and what do I want to uh, reaffirm today is mostly that we need a uniform definition of what is called the index event, because this has been used quite heterogeneously in the literature so far. And this slide gives you an impression of what I mean. This slide shows you all the randomized studies comparing stenting with surgery. And as you can see, some of these studies not even mentioned the definition of timing or uh, used uh, to treat patients with symptoms in the previous, uh, before three months. But there are also interesting data from Crest within one randomized trial using three different definitions of timing. And that's not what we can use if we want to compare data on outcome and the relevance of timing. So when we want to define a uniform definition, uh, you have several options summarized here. But I think it's clear to all of us that for the patient, from the patient perspective, there's only one definition relevant, and that's the very first event to the time of revascularization. So coming back to my first table that I showed to you, revealing the data by Rothwell and the CETC, they reported the date from randomization. And I think that should not uh, be done in the future again. We should only report from very first event to revascularization. So how uh, updated are the trials on which we base our current practice, on which we base um, the recommendations on surgery to stenting? And this is quite a busy slide, but it overviews 
the uh, the European trials on stenting versus surgery and also Crest from the US. And I'd like to focus on the lower half of the slide reporting on timing from qualifying event. So that, not, that does not necessarily mean very first event, but at least the event that brought the patient to the hospital uh, for the several trials. And you can see that actually also the, the data are quite limited on expedited intervention with two trials uh, are not reporting uh, data on timing in the, in the beginning and the other trials among which the largest trial we have so far on symptomatic patients comparing standing with surgery, the ICSS, with only one out of four patients being treated within four weeks. And that means we only have very scarce data on the safety of very early surgery and especially on the safety of very early stenting. So there's some work to do for us. So for today, I think that's the most important uh, issue. When, when we talk about timing of intervention, especially for future studies, we need to be sure what, what we are talking about, what was the uh, timing revealing to, and I think the definition should refer to index event from the very first event that the patient had. And we also need uh, absolutely more data on safety of stenting in the very early phase. But also, um, when we delay our intervention uh, using current medication, we need to know how many events may occur in that waiting time, because also those data are still relevant. That's it for now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Gert. And uh, we're having some nice activity on the, um, uh, on, on the chat line. And uh, there is a question about when you expect the new guidelines to appear. And let me just reiterate what Gert says. They are actually online and you can go and get them for free on uh, www.esvs.org and click on guidelines so you will find them there. Um, there was another question on how many unnecessary carotid revascularizations do you think are performed when you show that only a small proportion of those in the trials were actually within the first two weeks? And you made the point that it's probably much more efficient or we save many more strokes by operating or stenting within the first one or two weeks. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is actually happening out there? Do we have any data on that? Well, that's an interesting question. I think the first um, issue to make clear is that in my opinion, it's not a bad thing to treat a patient outside the 14 days uh, interval. Um, when you go into the deep, there are some uh, patient criteria and patient characteristics that still make it worthwhile to intervene also after the 14 days. So that, that's issue number one. And that may, for example, in the Netherlands of relevance also for political reasons, because uh, doctors, but also hospitals, are accounted for the percentage of patients that they treat within 14 days. Um, that's in itself uh, 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 very good. But on the other hand, patients may be withheld an intervention when they are uh, on day 16, while they still may benefit from the intervention. Um, that may especially account for patients with a stroke for male patients probably less for women with ocular symptoms. And that is something I think we could potentially derive from the ongoing European carotid surgery trial number two, which is especially focusing on symptomatic patients with a potential low risk for a recurrent event. Henning. Thank you, Gerd. Very nice talk. Uh, I would love to come back to this uh, issue of index events. Uh, I think it's just not only the index event, because not just a few patients show up with a TIA two weeks ago, then an amaurosis one week ago, then a minor stroke, etc., or the other way around. So shouldn't we add not only index event, but also say the last index event is, is the, 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 the time, point in time when the clock is running, or the first one? What do you think? Yeah, you raise a very important uh, topic, especially when our patients presenting with ocular symptoms, mm. they may have a, a serious delay because it's not recognized as a vascular symptom from the beginning. Um, so I absolutely agree that we should be aware on the type of symptom and also on the type of recurrent symptom. 
And on a personal note, but that refers to your previous question, and I don't think we have real data on that, but I believe that on patients uh, that had a quite severe but still minor stroke, they may benefit from a short delay to intervention, a few days, while patients with a single TIA and ocular symptoms, when we catch them in the early days, they can be safely treated in the very early phase when they enter the hospital. But that's, that's personal opinion. We don't have any data on that. I know from the Danish vascular registry that the average time from referral to we operate them, referral to vascular surgery, we operate them is around 10 days. And yeah. then there's typically a few days from the symptoms until they get referred to us, which is typically very quick. Do you have data from the big German registry, Henny? Uh, well, we have, uh, we had four weeks, 10 to 12 years ago, delay between the onset of symptoms and revascularization, mostly carotid and arrhythmia, but we came down over the last years to eight to nine days on okay. average. And I wonder a little bit because Denmark has a centralized healthcare system. So especially those things should work yeah. better. <laughs> that, that's a long discussion. Um, <laughs> maybe we should avoid that here because that okay. becomes more administrative uh, and okay. <laughs> uh, logistic than it becomes something about the disease. Mm -hmm. We're having a lot of questions, which is uh, great. And I'm going to ask you both who should perform the duplex scanner carotis to make the decision to perform surgery. I presume the question is relates to is it something the surgeon does or the surgeon's department or radiology or what's your opinion? I think that's your, your, your personal uh, organization. Um, if you have a, a reliable <laughs> vascular laboratory which is available seven days a week, probably you should uh, uh, rely on that. If it, for example, is not available for the weekend, you definitely have a problem there. So it, it relies potentially mostly on your on your local uh, logistics. Um, to be sure, I don't believe that you should do an intervention in the middle of the night. If you have a symptomatic patient coming in, for example, at, at five or six o'clock in the evening, I think you should do the workup at that time, uh, especially the imaging and the, so that you have the type of lesion and the characteristics of the patients and then schedule your intervention for the next morning if you want to do the expedited intervention. But yeah. I don't see any need uh, to have it to have it. So, so, OK, let's I mean, we have questions on the timing also. So let, let's uh, take that a little bit further. So you have this patient that comes in with some kind of a stroke and you do the imaging and you find a, a, a amenable lesion and you say, yes, there is indication. Is there anything in the level or the severity of the stroke that would prohibit you from operating the next day, if you could? Well, stroke severity as, as, as defined by ranking scale is by minor and major. And there has been some criteria defined in the, in the past, such as uh, floating symptoms or unstable symptoms, so-called. Uh, that's quite different from repetitive TIAs. That's quite a different group because yeah. I think that repetitive TIAs are a perfect indication to perform expedited intervention. But when you have unstable uh, 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 severity of symptoms or also, um, uh, for example, changes in consciousness, I think that's a very dangerous condition and where you might uh, delay on purpose and not perform expedited intervention. But remaining paresis of an extremity will not inhibit you or stop you from operating? No. No. Henning? No. No. no, just uh, I, I'm absolutely with you. I think this is a great, a great a sort of a gray zone between early or urgent but still elective reconstructions or surgeries and true emergency cases. I mean, if you have a patient with a true crescendo TIA and he shows up with a minor stroke, and has a flotating thrombus and the carotid bifurcation. This is surely a true emergency case also for the night to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, others who came in and said, well, it's getting better. It was, was worse a couple of hours ago, but now it's getting better. Those are the ones who can stabilize for a couple of days to get to a neurological plateau phase. So it is a very individualized approach. And it's not only on us, it's also on, 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 on the st uh, stroke physician's side. Exactly. So you need, you need collaboration. Just a short remark from my side. I think every trainee and every vascular surgeon should be able 
to perform carotid duplex ultrasound on its own. Whether he, he or she should do every case is another issue, mm. but it's he or she should learn that sufficiently, everybody. We don't, we don't come to the, to the issue of <laughs> optimal imaging, but that, that, that yeah, we will discuss sure, later sure. on, of course. Sure. Yeah. Let's get back to the issue of the difference in um, the risk of endarterectomy and stenting. Yeah. And um, you showed quite clearly that, uh, that, at least from the randomized trials, there was a very clear picture that the risk was double or triple of stenting in the early phase, one or two weeks, compared to endarterectomy. And I think that we got very good um, um, database uh, registry uh, support for, for those observations. So, um, but let's say you have a case where you're not happy operating, you would like to uh, consider stenting, for instance, if it was a, you know, a very high lesion or redo or something. What are there, would, would there be any considerations where you would say, well, if I have to stent and you know, the patient had his minor stroke yesterday, then what? Well, that, that, that's an important, so that's, that's um, patients that are not suitable for surgery, so to say. Uh, they were not Let's in, say increased were not, risk for surgery for some reason. Right. Um, they were not included in the trials. Okay. That's an important issue to yep. state. So we don't have any randomized data on them, although the SAPPHIRE trial uh, aimed to include uh, some of those, but those were mostly asymptomatic. So uh, SAPPHIRE doesn't help us really there. Uh, that means that I think you should look at the other criteria of the patient. Um, when you discuss that you don't have an option for surgery, and that stenting may be the only option for the patient to treat the lesion. If that is the optimal uh, intervention to treat the patient is still out for discussion. Yeah. But, but that, off, that happens quite often, especially in tertiary referral centers and the academic center that you have basically only one option to treat, especially when the patient has recurrent symptoms. Yeah. It gets us to one of the questions we, we get uh, from the chat, uh, and um, do you actually see a future for stenting? I mean, you know, we're three surgeons sitting here and we might be biased. On the other hand, I think that we do recognize that there are situations where it's actually preferable. Could, could you both maybe give an example or two of that? I'm sure that there will be a future for carotid artery stenting. I mean, I'm involved in some trials with a transcarotid mm -hmm. Uh, artery stenting system with flow reversals, so we are the common carotid artery. And uh, so far we've done almost 100 cases, uh, had no problems and have the same rates of microemboli that we um, have with surgery. So in, again, in selected patients, it's not one size fits all. No. We have really to individualize, to personalize our treatment algorithms. And it is always good to go to an institution where all the modalities, inclu including conservative therapy, stroke physicians, etc., are avail available. Uh, uh, there is a future. Whether the stents in itself will improve to that extent that they will be superior, maybe in terms of restenosis, uh, mesh, micro mesh stents, etc. I don't know, this is the future will tell, but um, the excess, a different excess might be a crucial <laughs> step to bring um, stenting again on the, on the stage. I think it may be related to the severity of the symptom, as I just said, and especially the, the harmed uh, cerebral uh, territory in the, in the brain, which may also uh, uh, be damaged further when you uh, may cause hyperperfusion uh, due to stenting. And interestingly, uh, there are very little data on, uh, on cerebral monitoring in, uh, in stenting procedures as well. And we just um, reviewed the outcome of the occurrence of hyperperfusion in stenting. And that's actually an important uh, cause of uh, adverse events, mm -hmm. ipsilateral stroke following carotid stenting. So, so we have the options to further improve um, and the safety of carotid stenting. So yes, I, I absolutely agree with Henning. There is a clear future for, for stenting and probably then a surgery will be used for those cases that cannot be stented. 
So the last question I think is very relevant is this thing of avoiding uh, hemorrhagic transformation, which is, I guess, m the most feared complication. And uh, the question is whether it's, uh, it makes a difference to delay surgery if you want to avoid hemorrhagic transformation. Yeah, that was a bit where I just referred to. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. I think the, 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 the brain is still uh, damaged in the early phase. And when you uh, open the artery, by stenting and not take uh, into account very strict blood pressure measures which should probably be guided in my opinion on transcranial doppler or any other guidance then you might lose several patients uh, due to the risk of hemorrhagic transformation based on hyperperfusion so uh, probably better monitoring during stenting and also especially taking into account uh, blood pressure uh, uh, regulation yeah. in the post-stenting phase may already uh, prevent uh, adverse events. And regarding the blood pressure, you always need to remember that the brain has been living behind the stenosis, so it's used to a lower pressure than what we normally would call a normal pressure. So actually be very rigorous and keep the blood pressure very low in the, uh, yeah. in the cases at risk. We have, we have uh, large experience with the definition of patients as risk for hyperperfusion uh, on surgery, uh, also based on transcranial Doppler protocol. And those patients can be referred to uh, medium care ward yeah. or even intensive care and a very strict blood pressure uh, lowering therapy. Um, if the transcranial Doppler shows that there is not a significant increase in, in, um, in the uh, middle cerebral artery territory, then you can safely uh, discharge these patients even if the blood pressure is a little bit on yeah. the on the higher side and you can do it on the outpatient ward so that's a, an important measure to to uh, um, treat patients on an individual basis so I think that we should uh, continue to our next item uh, this is very exciting with the timing but now we uh, made the, the indication and now we need to operate a case and uh, Henning please tell us local anesthesia is that really superior to general anesthesia yes thank you very much hello everybody and thanks for the congratulations that we just uh, reading here <laughs> to this uh, format of the ASVS webinar uh, this congratulation goes to the current president of the ASVS Henrik Sillerson my um, idea was to talk a little bit about issues uh, that might improve the procedural results of carotid surgery. And the part one is local anesthesia is superior to general anesthesia. Uh, these are my disclosures. Nothing of them uh, are related to the talk. If you look at the uh, guideline from the ESVS in conjunction with the European Society of Cardiology, by the way, um, we have recommendation 49, very strong recommendation, level one. It is recommended that choice of anesthesia for CA uh, general versus local regional should be left to the surgical team's decretion. So, um, and this is based on uh, mainly on systematic reviews, and I will show you that in a minute, and we'll also come to some observational data from Germany, new data from the carotid stenosis trialist collaboration, and finally, just a few data from Munich. This is the uh, latest Cochrane review from 2013, uh, where 14 randomized trials were evaluated, uh, local versus general anesthesia for carotid surgery, a little bit more than 4,500 operations, 3,500 from them from still one of the biggest surgical trials ever, that's the GALA trial. And what you can see here that the rates of stroke, excuse me, here is stroke, and under local versus general anesthesia and the rates of death also were pretty comparable. The only difference, of course, was detected uh, in the use of shunt if you perform surgery under local anesthesia, the indication for shunting is less uh, often given than if you do it un under general uh, anesthesia. And if you look at the combined data, the stroke death rates at 30 days, you see 3.6 versus 4.2 percent, no significant difference at all. So obviously we have no differences between general and local anesthesia, but let's have a look 
to other data, real-world data or registry data. Um, Michael Kalmeyer, who works in my department, has collected all the annual reports from the Quality Assurance Program in Germany over the years from 2003 to 2014. It was published in the Journal of Cardiovascular Surgery a couple of years ago. And what you can see here is that the use of local anesthesia has increased significantly from 10% up to 30%. And I think meanwhile, we are close to 40%. And at the same time, we detected that the uh, in-hospital stroke and death rates decreased for asymptomatic patients from roughly 2% to 1% and for symptomatic patients from around 4% to around 2%. So is there any interaction between the use of local anesthesia and better outcomes? This is another analysis that we did together with the um, with a group in Germany who collect all the data and had all the original files from the quality carotid quality assurance program. Uh, this is the data bank and we were able to get access to uh, more than 140,000 cases, surgical cases for asymptomatic or symptomatic stenosis. All over the use of local anesthesia was 27.3 percent. The rates of in any in hospital to, in any in hospital stroke or death between 2009 and 14 was 1.9, and we performed several statistical analysis, including uni and multivariable regression analysis. And this is uh, the multivariable analysis, where you see general anesthesia as one local with an uh, adjusted risk ratio of 0 0.85, statistically significant, and the combined and switched group, which is, of course, the patient group with co intraoperative complications uh, or insufficient local anesthesia, et cetera, had a higher risk. So the risk reduction was by 15% for patients operated under local anesthesia, the relative risk reduction. This was statistically highly significant. Uh, and is it really true that randomized trials didn't found any difference between local and general anesthesia? This is again an analysis from the carotid stenosis trialist collaboration. Uh, CSTC has pulled individual patient data from major investigator initiated initiated randomized trials in the beginning space, ICSS EVA 3S. Meanwhile, also CREST and GALA and other trials. And the great benefit that we have, that we have larger numbers, more precision, we can perform subgroup analysis and the uh, generalizability is uh, definitely increased. And here you see uh, this paper is almost published, is submitted to stroke, the second revision. That way here, if you look, all patients local versus general an anesthesia. All of them are symptomatic patients, of course. There is significant risk reduction by 30%. The adjusted risk ratio is 0 0.7, statistically significant. And if you look at the GALA patients, GALA was was uh, equivalent. But if you just look at the GALA symptomatic patients, there's also almost a statistically significant effect. So the relative risk reduction for local anesthesia is 30%, which is uh, not neg 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 negligible. Um, this is another uh, sub-analysis sub, uh, of a randomized trial, namely the CREST trials. And they looked at the anesthetic type and the risk of myocardial infarction after CAA in CREST, published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery 2016. And what you can see here in red, that is the incidence of myocardial infarction in the patient group operated under general anesthesia. And the two upper lines are the patients who operated under local anesthesia, not very many, but uh, more, than, more than 100, and 
the patients treated by stenting. And you see that, and we discussed that so often, the different MI rates uh, in, in the crest. And if you look at the type of anesthesia, you see that the MI rates after carotid stenting were very, very similar to the MI rates after CEA under local anesthesia. This is, I think, a very important observation. How do we do in Munich? You see, we started with general anesthesia, but over the years, the numbers has declined to less than 10% now. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the numbers of local anesthesia has declined. And similar to the observation that we made in Germany, uh, the in-hospital stroke and death rates decreased from 2.4% down to 1% in asymptomatic patients and 3.5% down to about 2% in symptomatic patients. Uh, we will look at that uh, in more in detail um, uh, in the near future. So in summary, CEA under local or local regional anesthesia comes with lower stroke death and MI rates. It gives you a perfect neuromonitoring. Shunting can be performed very selectively. I think patients should be informed about uh, the pros and cons of local and general anesthesia. And of course, it needs a very close collaboration of surgeon anesthetists. This is a video from our department. This is from a paper, uh, how to, to, you, to make it. And very important that this sort of local anesthesia is performed under ultrasound control. That is something that has not been performed in Gala as long as I know. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Henning. Uh, I think you made a uh, good case um, despite the um, guidelines. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but uh, let me ask you to speculate. Let's say that we, the, I think the data looks uh, clear. <coughs> can you, but can you explain why? What is it that makes local better than general? Well, if, if we look at the, I mean, we should distinguish, I think, between stroke rates and myocardial infarction. Sure. I think stroke, the stroke rates are lower due to the fact that the person, the patient is awake. You have a very, you have a perfect neurological control. You can talk to the patients, the anesthetist can talk, all the nurses, and we give them, and many do that, give them in a dark, a small dark mm. to squeeze in the opposite hand, and we always talk with them. So Not, we, and, and, and it is really a matter of fact that they start up with conversations and talking about her life or yeah. her, uh, their lives, etc. So this is very, very good. The second, uh, and this is may be may relate to the lower incidence of myocardial infarction, that the blood pressure management is easier. Uh, patients really have st the, the the blood pressure will be increased in the clamping time. Let's say up to 150 or 60 systolically. And then it goes down to 130 and 40 again after declamping, and that's it. No further increase of uh, hypertension that we, at least I observed so often in the awakening fast yeah. that it goes up. And I think this uh, reduces myocardial stress and may have a positive impact on the lower incidence of myocardial infarction. So, so, I, find that, so I find that interesting because um, does that mean that you have an anesthesiologist on the OR or on the oh, intervention yeah. room? Always. always. Always, always, So, Because I think that's an important issue also to bring to the audience because some think that doing it on a local makes it, it just the patient and the surgeon, but that's mm -hmm. not true. The whole team, including the anesthesiologist, is still intact to to adjust, for example, on blood pressure when, when needed. But your experience is that it's easier. Yeah, technically, technically, it is possible to learn local anesthesia under ultrasound control. Everybody can learn that, of course. Yeah. But it's not just the administration of the agents. It is also very uh, important to, to monitor the patients, to talk to the patients, to calm down the patients. It's not an everyday situation. <laughs> yeah, we know that. So. Uh, they, of, of course, there's some sort of stress, but, but it's a team approach. And if, and and what we do also is, and what I find very important is that the positioning of the patient is a bit different. We two surgeons are standing on the side of the surgery. 
So, and the patient has a free view to the ceiling. Yeah. So this is very important. And but, he has eye to eye contact directly with a nurse. But Maybe. if I understand you, the, the, the most important thing is that this is the optimal neuromonitoring monitoring. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. before anything else, you know, if something is wrong, which could take longer time to pick up by other methods. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the drawbacks maybe is that you end up shunting very few patients. Mm -hmm. in, in our institution, it's less than 10% due to always using local. And if you have surgeons that don't do many endarterectomies, they become maybe a little bit uneasy with using the shunt. Mm -hmm. And I think we know that the shunt itself can cause uh, complications if you're not used to it. So what is your feeling about that? I, I couldn't agree more. That's, that's one of the few weak points. Uh, our shunt incidence is close to 5% meanwhile. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, I mean, it is not justifiable to, to do general anesthesia just to be trained also on the long run and shunting. If, it, if you don't need a shunt for 95% of the patients, it is something that's needed only for 5%. And if that's the case, and in, in, in all the training institutions, usually an experienced vascular surgeon operates or trains the trainee, uh, it should be feasible. Um, it is, it is a, a bit more difficult if you're not doing it every day, I agree, but it's not that a big, not such a big deal. I mean, I, I had a question on the, on the interesting paper on the myocardial infarction, mm -hmm. um, because then it's always the question, what was the definition of myocardial infarction, mm -hmm. especially within Quest, it, Crest, it was mostly biochemical. So are we talking about biochemical myocardial infarction, which may be related to the type of anesthesia when operating on a general, or is this clinical MI? Well, um I had another slide with all those data, <laughs> but I was asked to perform that it's viewable also on a smartphone, so I put them out. But I, if, I, if I'm, I'm right, uh, this effect was visible in all subgroups similarly. Um, of course, uh, also in Crest, if you look at the, the, the myocardial infarction that we assess as myocardial infarction, mm. CG changes, uh, ch um, breast, breast um, pain, etc. Then the incidence was low anyway. And to find any differences sure. is not easy. But anyhow, but the benefit of local was, yes, yes. was and, for both and, stroke and, and MI. And again, and also, I, guess I mean, I also took part in those discussions, but also the biochemical MIs. Uh, are associated with a worse life prognosis. Yeah. So yeah. they have to ta be taken serious. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. So we have a question where, uh, where um, the audience asks, how many endarterectomies should a surgeon do <laughs> per week or per month or per year? Do you have an opinion? Yeah, I have an opinion. Um, I think, and I, I refer to that already a little bit when talking about timing of the intervention, I think it's the total team that performs the intervention. Of course, you need an experienced surgeon and a well-skilled interventionist, but in the end, it's also the uh, anesthesiologist. It's the, the, in our center, the neurologist that performs the neuromonitoring, and that's the critical triangle uh, delivering the good results. Um, when you talk about standardization <coughs> of the procedure, therefore, I think it's critical to also use always the same uh, approach. And that's why I think, and that maybe you can, you can um, comment on that, Henning, I think it's very difficult if you have some surgeons in your center performing on their local and some performing on their yeah. uh, general and some do it with patching and some do um, uh, different uh, 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 surgical techniques, then you have a mix up of techniques and also two approaches. So is there an absolute number of, of uh, interventions that you should perform? I wouldn't know. There are, there are more and more data that high volume centers and therefore also high volume surgeons and interventionists in the end have better results. And then you talk probably about something around 50, 60 in, the, in that in that region, but as a center minimum per as, year, 
Absolutely. Yeah. What do you think, Henning? Well, I would love to come from the other way around. I, I would say it doesn't make any sense for an in individual vascular surgeon to perform uh, below 10 carotid surgeries a year. This is, it doesn't make sense for him, for the patients, not for the hospital. Um, there's a, there's a, a big gray zone and also experience, of course, plays a role. And um, I would say on average, a carotid surgeon should perform at least 25 surgeries per year, which equals to two cases a month. But this is the, the, lower, the lower limit. Okay, so I think the last question we can take from the from the live chat is, uh, uh, what do we prefer ourselves? And let me just <laughs> say that my institution, uh, local, is the first choice for ten years uh, or more, and uh, general anesthesia is only done if the patient insists on it, and we cannot yeah. talk them from it, or we convert uh, because they they cannot co um, um, cooperate during the operation or something issues with blood pressure. How often is that in your center? Because in Gala, that was quite often, one no. in every six patients. No, but no, when no, you no. ask no. Uh, if patients centers, are well prepared, if you spend a little time uh, before surgery, prepare them to what, what, what can you expect from being in local, it's much less than that. Yeah, yeah. that's an interesting oh, yeah. Uh, aspect. Uh, yeah. When we started, I asked all patients, would you, would you prefer another local anesthesia for the opposite side if, if there's a need for surgery? And they said, and I'm sure 90% said yes. It's not very nice. You want to, you are not interested to have that operation every day, but on balance, it was a very, very good experience. Do you have a different opinion, Gerd? Uh, I do, uh, but it's also potentially based on case mix because okay. we had a lot of referrals with either tandem lesions or high lesions, a lot of redos. Um, and we also perf per uh, perform it mostly on the general, uh, in, the, in the training setting uh, and, as, and as part of standardization, but especially probably uh, for the case mix. But maybe you can... But we train, training is under local also. We were afraid that training is going to be very difficult because the patient hears all the commands of the senior <laughs> surgeons, but it turned out that this is not an issue at all. Yeah even if, if it takes sometimes two hours, they, they, uh, don't, they, they, they don't and, worry about that. And when you turn it around, are there uh, cases which you exclude for local anesthesia? Oh, yeah. uh, how, how, what's the percentage of your caseload? Um, morphological exclusions are recurrent stenosis or radiogenic stenosis or uh, very, very high uh, lesions or something especially, it's, but it's, it's below 5%. Okay, I think we should leave it there and get on with our next topic, uh, which is um, now we've done the operation and uh, can intraoperative completion studies reduce the procedural risk further, Henning? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, this is the agenda. So why are we doing completion imaging? What does the literature tell us? How should we do that or can we do that? And can we compare angiography and duplex ultrasound by any means? If you look at uh, some papers, this is pretty old, but I think it has not changed since then, to, uh, almost 20 years old, causes of perioperative stroke after carotid endarectomy. You see that more than 50% of the patients suffer a thrombosis and thromboembolism as a cause of a perioperative stroke and only 15% suffer from intracranial hemorrhage. So technical errors are still, that was the conclusion in that paper, still the most common cause of perioperative strokes. And if you perform such an intraoperative angiography, you can be pretty sure that technically everything is perfect, the blood flow is perfect, and that any problems after the surgery uh, on the on the intensive care unit or the intermediate care, so might not be related to the reconstruction it's, itself. On the other hand, if you see such a lesion here, you can be sure that something went wrong, and this has to be corrected. In this case, with a dark run interposition and a, again a control uh, angiography. So, what does the ESVS carotid guideline tell us?
Recommendation 59, targeted monitoring. This is not the issue here, but quality control strategies may be considered to reduce the risk of preoperative stroke. Uh, it's just a 2B recommendation, not strong. Uh, it's, it's a weak recommendation uh, and the level of evidence is very low. In the, in the manuscripts, the authors write, however, that evidence suggests that quality control strategies may reduce the incidence of perioperative strokes and deaths. Uh, many papers are out there in the literature, some of them from the 80s or 19s of the last century, and no randomized trials at all, no head-to-head -head comparisons between either angiography or duplex ultrasound or no control and uh, angiography or no control and duplex ultrasound. So no true head-to-head -head, um, com um, comparisons. Uh, different revision criteria, which makes things life even a bit more complicated and all over the revision rates <clears throat> varied between 3 and 8%. So are there any new data on intraoperative control imaging after CEA? Again, we come to the German carotid registry and the paper from Michael Kallmeier from 2015. I mentioned already that we observed a, um, a, re a reduction of the in-hospital stroke and death rates, both for symptomatic and symptomatic patients. And we also observed that the use of intraoperative completion studies, namely angiography or duplex ultrasound, has increased from about 30% in the beginning of the century to 50% in, the, um, in 2013. And again, we looked at the original data. I mentioned that in my earlier talk, more than 140,000 patients or almost 140,000 cases. <laughs> and in the multivariable analysis, we detected that angiography and the use of angiography and ultrasound during the surgery were associated with a significant decrease of in-hospital stroke and death rates, namely 20% by angiography and 26% um, by uh, duplex ultrasound. So this was not the case for flow measurements or other techniques. So how do we do this? This is a, we make a puncture of the common carotid artery. Patient is under local anesthesia. This is the neck, here is the brain. Make use of a, I, I use an uppercut candle once I have a, a backflow, can connect it with a um, extension line. This extension line should also be filled. Um, please avoid any air bubbles in the line. That could be dangerous, very important. And then we fix the extension line here and uh, clamp with a Yazagil clamp the external carotid artery for the first image. This is the situation in our hybrid OR. Um, where you can position the CR perfectly. You can make uh, two different positions from the side and from uh, AP if it's necessary, but usually one, one um, pro projection is fine. And this is the first angio with a clamped external carotid artery, perfect result. And the other one comes a bit later. So now the external carotid artery has been declamped and also this, the external is patent. So are there any differences between angiography and duplex ultrasound and which findings should be corrected? Um, this is the machine that we use for uh, interoperative ultrasound. It comes from Norway, from the Medistim company, with a very small probe which can be adjusted to the common carotid artery and also the reconstructed internal carotid artery. This is a transverse um, a projection, a longitudinal projection. You can also, of course, make use of uh, color-coded ultrasound. In my experience, B mode is enough and very fine. You can also make flow measurements, of course. 
if you see this edge, something like this, and you see it very, very nicely. This is not flotating, but that was an inversion and arterectomy with an edge at the end. And I think this, I would feel better if that's corrected. If you see this sort of uh, mobile material, which were thrombi and left debris, actually, it should be removed, of course, and, and another control then after the removal shows you that everything is fine now. Mm -hmm. So we performed a small trial, so-called CDAC trial, comparison of intraoperative doublic ultrasound and angio after CA. It's a consecutive series of 150 patients. We had a stroke and death rate of 1.3%. <coughs> we all patients were assessed by angiography and ultrasound during the operation. The, uh, the number of technical defects were in the range of 12% and 9% we detected severe defects, a bit more uh, by duplex ultrasound than by angio. And we also saw that senior consultants had a higher agreement between angiography and ultrasound. So there's surely something like a learning curve, uh, especially this B-mode ultrasound, you see almost every erythrocyte flowing by. So this has to be learned a little bit. And we looked at the interrater reliability of duplex ultrasound and angiography. And actually, this was higher with ultrasound than with angiography. Uh, the paper will be published soon, hopefully. It's under, it's submitted in, and it, it's under revision. This is a final example showing you a pretty nice angiography here on this side, but by ultrasound we detected some residual plaques and removed them by reopening the artery. They look very, very small and very harmless, but if they block an M2 segment intracranially, uh, the, the consequences might not be that funny. So in summary, intraoperative angiography and or WX ultra ultrasound are associated with lower stroke and death rates. At least this is something that the German carotid registry tells us. Uh, the pro is that technical errors can be corrected immediately. You have always a very valid documentation of the technical result. However, Yes, the weak point is that we are still working on valid revision criteria that might be applicable also to different clinics. But, and just as a final word in endovascular therapy, a final image is key. No interventionist would ever perform PTA or stenting without having a control image at the end of the procedure. So intraoperative morphological control is a must Trust, but verify, doverai, no poverai, as President Ronald Reagan mentioned in the context of nuclear disarmament. <laughs> thank you very much, and I'm happy again <laughs> to take some questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Henning. Uh, this was uh, very interesting and uh, nice with uh, some of your own data, since we don't have any from bigger trials. Now, we have actually a question that states that NGO is not reliable for detection of small but relevant problems in the carotids. And um, there's also a question uh, whether you perform your, all your interactions <coughs> in your hybrid room. And um, uh, did you give us the answer? Is ultrasound actually preferable? <laughs> well, let's have the first question first. It's easier to answer. No. Uh, uh, if the hybrid OR is available, we do it there. But we have two other ORs where we have very good C-arm systems which uh, give us the same and almost the same information. And uh, for ultrasound, it doesn't make a difference whether you work in the hybrid or in a standard OR. Uh, what is better? What is the future? Well, what we learn and are currently learning that uh, ultrasound shows you every detail of your reconstructed artery. And it might come out at the end of the discussion and further data acquisition that if you do CA under local anesthesia and nothing happens, then you are, can be very, very sure that there's no embolism in the brain. So you just can focus on your local reconstruction. And then ultrasound might be the better choice. By the way, you avoid, of course, radiation and, and contrast medium. And you don't need to use the uh, If you 
Yes. Yeah. And if you but if you operate uh, under general anesthesia routinely and you don't have any other neuromonitoring indicating indicating for example an M1 occlusion intraoperatively then uh, angiography has truly the benefit that you can visualize not the bi not just the bifurcation but also the intracranial arteries uh, in different projections. That might also help individual. I, I would say, uh, practically thinking, ultrasound might be the future, but angio is still needed in certain under certain circumstances and should be available yeah. in every OR. Good. Yeah, I wondered, and uh, you, you perform mostly the surgery under local anesthesia mm -hmm. and always with the completion, but do you use any other uh, cerebral monitoring tools during no. the... We used yeah. everything from TCD, SCP, sometimes also EEG, but we or NEARS, near infrared. Yeah. We if, just we just don't do it any longer. Yeah, I, I was just going to say if the, you know if the patient is doing fine and is yeah. awake, and and you would see a drop in TCD or or you would see a drop in, in NEARS, what would you do about it? Well, we, exactly, <laughs> we do it on a general. Yeah. So we have, but we do it all the longitudinal antitrachectomy, and I think. I also understood that you do mostly eversion. And Myself, yes, but uh, many training cases are conventional and are rectomies. Okay, and the clamping that's, time that's, might that's, take I think an important thirty issue minutes or so. Because you have a, a good outview on the distal endpoint with the open yeah. longitudinal antarterectomy. That's yeah. your critical phase. You should have a, a, a close look if there's no uh, redundant internal carotid artery. Yeah. Uh, which may kink or, or cause other obstruction. Sure. And then when you have on your transcranial Doppler any adverse uh, signal, either being uh, embolization uh, or um, a, a lower flow state than, than, than before surgery or not restoring flow after declamping, then you should really be alert. And that leads mostly to reopening the, the carotid artery. So I noticed that in your data set you had um, angiography and you had ultrasound. You also had flowmetry, and I know that historically many of us used to measure flow. And when we had the nice high flow with high diastolic velocity, we would be happy. Now it didn't show uh, the same performance as ultrasound and angiography, and may, it may be clear to some of us. But maybe you would explain why is it that uh, that uh, flowmetry may maybe not is sufficient. Well, uh, first, first of all, flow or good flow or bad flow to the brain is only in about 10% of all carotid related strokes, the reason for the uh, cerebral ischemia. So it doesn't matter if you have a high flow or low flow after the reconstruction uh, in the brain, the auto regulation will, will correct that over time, it takes sometimes a little bit. Um, flow measurements are nice to see, well, we have now 60 to 40 percent, 60 percent goes to the internal and 40 to the external. This is the normal distribution of the carotid flow. It's nice to have. And uh, but that's it. You, you can't you can't detect any morphological problems or uh, any embolism or any stenosis reducing. that you have created any flaps that had been left, yeah. nothing. So uh, it is nice to have, it's more important for distal bypass surgery. And sometimes if you reopen the pseudo occlusion, it might be reasonable to perform also flow measurement on the internal artery to see whether there is any flow after endorectomy. But these are very, very rare yeah. cases. So let's speculate a little bit about that. You know, the point you're making is that <coughs> High resolution ultrasound may actually see some flaps or thrombos that mm. may not be easy to see on NGO. Yeah. And you say, well, you know, for stenting, imaging is crucial, and they do NGO. But then they miss the small things, don't they? Yes. So could stenting <laughs> become more safe if they added ultrasound? And what should they do about it if they saw something? This is a very clever question. Of course. <laughs> I never thought about that. Yes, uh, I think so. I mean, the, uh, admittedly, the, the resolution imaging in the Angel Suites is very, very good and yeah. maybe a little bit better than in our standard right. OAS. However, uh, we know that microembolism occurs 
sometimes also after the procedure, after stenting. And uh, we, we, we know that from these WMRI uh, yeah, studies. Exactly. Um, maybe maybe uh, we should advise them and say, well, angios is, is nice, is good, is a good quality control, but have you ever considered also to perform and duplex ultrasound directly on the neck. Maybe this is another good idea. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree, you, 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 you brought in your conclusion. There needs to be a definition of the residual defects yeah. Yeah. that actually need to be yeah. uh, reconstructed or corrected. And yeah. that's probably the same for, for the stenting uh, situation. Yeah. Yeah, that's work to be done. I mean, it's clear if you have a good result, nothing to do if, if it's uh, if it's blocked. For example, of course, it has to be reopened. And then there are some severe defects, which you, which I showed you some. Yeah. Uh, this has also to be removed and, and to be corrected. But there is still a gray zone I, where we ought sometimes also to cast leave it or reopen it. Yeah. And the longer we make use of the system, the more we tend to be a bit more liberal and not to correct any small threat floating there. <laughs> you know? Okay, so uh, maybe we should uh, go to our last uh, topic of today, and uh, that is uh, what are the pathophysiological mechanisms of procedural stroke if it happens? Good. Thank you. Why is this important? Um, I, I want to show you two recent papers and both actually come from the uh, collaborate group combining data from the European trials and also including CREST data. Uh, and this paper uh, published in April uh, this year on the long-term outcome of stenting and end arterectomy gives a very important message. I start with the upper left part and you see actually two couple of myographs. And this on the left one, A, shows you the outcome data of the combined trial data, including the procedural outcome. And number uh, B on the right uh, shows you when you take out the 30-day data, so the procedural outcome is taken out of the graphs, and this just shows you the uh, stroke and death rate during uh, follow-up, uh, showing almost equal outcome for either uh, stented or operated patients. So based on this graph, it seems that the difference is purely made in the beginning on being stented or operated, and then both procedures on the longer term perform equally well. And this uh, basically uh, graph A and B uh, are uh, referring to the composite outcome, but the very same is true when you look at major stroke for C and D, also uh, very much the same graphs. And as we all know, the difference between stenting and surgery is mostly made by minor strokes, and that is graph E and F, again showing that the difference is made more minor strokes with stenting as compared to surgery, but on the longer term, these patients all uh, do equally well. And graph G and N are on um, uh, all stroke. So this is an important message because it basically says that in the end it's all about the beginning. The periprocedural events, they dominate the outcomes of carotid stenting and antarctrectomy also on the long term. So it's important to look at the events that are caused by the uh, intervention itself. The second paper I want to uh, uh, have your attention for is this one, also a very recent uh, paper by the CSTC collaborate group. And this uh, paper looked at the uh, decline of adverse events, um, uh, especially stroke and death, over time. And uh, Henning already mentioned in his previous slide that also in Germany the, the event rate is going down over time. And this paper showed the same results for carotid antarterectomy for you on the uh, bit lower right from 2000 to 2008. The percentage of procedural stroke and death dropped from just above 7 to 2%. But this was not uh, corresponded by a decline in the stented arm where we saw a non-significant 
uh, uh, change from 8 to almost 6%. So apparently we did better over time within the trials with surgery, but we did not better over time combined with stenting. And the question then is why? What were the type of events uh, that occurred and can we do anything about those stented uh, events to make stenting more safe? So when you take a closer look at the pathophysiological mechanism of procedural stroke, it's important to categorize these strokes for type and territory, for the timing, when does the stroke occur, and of course for stroke severity. And when you analyze these data, you also take into account hemodynamic events that occurred, any technical difficulties as just discussed in the previous talk by Henning, and of course also uh, the status of the ipsilateral carotid artery following the stroke. Is this uh, treated artery still patent or not? First, I would like to discuss a little bit on the timing of procedural stroke, and then it's important to make a differentiation between intra-procedural stroke versus post-procedural stroke. And, and the upper part of the slide shows you when you uh, operate under general anesthesia, and you can see that interprocedural stroke is defined until the patient is fully awake from general anesthesia, and only then starts the post-procedural phase. For, for patients treated under local anesthesia, this is a bit different, of course, because they are awake uh, at the beginning, and there's an arbitrary differentiation, but we chose to uh, do this when the patient leaves the intervention room and then the post-procedural phase starts. And when is it in, why is it important to make this uh, distinction? Because there are some differences in the etiology of the type of procedural stroke. First, I'd like to show you this, uh, this slide, the etiology of intra-procedural strokes. And this can be either emboli due to unstable carotid plaque, which is uh, mobilized, or the uh, manipulation by wires, the stent itself, or um, the section thereafter, or the positioning of the shunt, or of course, emboli from the heart. There's also hemodynamic reasons, for example, uh, hypoperfusion due to the clamping, due to difficult shunt positioning, or balloon dilation and inflation, or of course due to uh, bioreceptor response or uncontrollable hypotension. And then there's of course, as Anning also showed on his, uh, one of his previous slides, uh, thrombus, a thrombus formation, uh, either in the shunt or in the artery or secondary to hypotension. So what are the options for us to manipulate and to prevent? Well, the quite many actually, and most of these etiologies uh, are in theory uh, preventable or uh, treatable. Uh, and this can be uh, adapted on either by uh, intraoperative uh, neuromonitoring or when you have the patient under local anesthesia to respond to uh, hyperperfusion or when you have a thrombus on your post-operative imaging, as just discussed, you may act as well. So the majority of these issues may be um, something for us to respond to. How about post-procedural? Well, many of the same uh, etiologies, again, emboli, hypoperfusion and thrombus formation, of course. The emboli this time may come from the antarthrectomized surface or intimal flaps or from the origin of the external carotid artery when it's insufficiently disobstructed, or again from cardiac emboli. Hyperperfusion again, especially under uh, general anesthesia, this may sometimes be a challenge. And of course, we have then hyperperfusion, which we also today in, the, in our uh, show uh, uh, partly discussed. And there's of course thrombus formation uh, either by disturbed hemostasis or again by technical errors. So what options do we have here? Are there any options for us to manipulate? Yes, again, the majority in my opinion. Um, so most have to deal with adequate manipulation by either the surgeon or adequate uh, intervention by the uh, anesthesiologist. And then most of these should be preventable in theory. If you look at the pathophysiological mechanism of stroke, uh, this may be a flow 
uh, chart which you can use. Uh, in the beginning it's important to make a differentiation between ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke then define the uh, mechanisms which are summarized at the bottom line and for the uh, ischemic strokes of course these are uh, embolic hemodynamic uh, caused by thrombus or thrombotic occlusion hyperperfusion or cardioembolic while for the hemorrhagic strokes this is mostly due to hyperperfusion or in several cases this remains undetermined. I will show you some slides now of an analysis we did within the ICSS trial and uh, this refers to about 27 uh, patients that had a stroke because of following surgery and 58 uh, patients with a procedural stroke due to stenting all of them, of course, within ICS as symptomatic patients at baseline. And when you look at stroke type, you can see that the majority of patients, almost all in the stenting arm, are of ischemic origin, while in the surgical arm, still one in every five strokes is related to a hemorrhagic stroke. When you look at the arterial territory, so on which side does the stroke occur, you can see that all uh, independent of the type of intervention, this is 90% uh, ipsilateral and just a few on the contralateral uh, hemisphere. Concerning uh, severity, also already a bit discussed, you can see that the majority <coughs> of uh, strokes in the standing arm is of course minor stroke and non-disabling while this is a bit the other way around in the uh, surgical arm there were less strokes but from the 27 strokes that did occur um, uh, uh, almost two-thirds were uh, disabling how about the timing of stroke i explained this is irrelevant for the mechanism and also for your options to respond if it's intraprocedural or post-procedural and here you can see the differentiation between day zero the day of the intervention in the yellow circle and you can see that the majority of the events due to stenting occurred on the day of the procedure while for surgery more than half of the events occurred in the days after on day one to day 30. again this is all in symptomatic patients icss data how about patency of the carotid artery and this is something that was really astonishing when we did this uh, analysis actually because um, we believe that it's always crucial to have not only the brain imaged after the stroke but also the treated artery uh, but to our surprise we found that although some patients did have imaging as you can see here with some of them indeed uh, residual stenosis or maybe residual defects and some of them a uh, acute occlusion of the artery the most astonishing effect was that in the in, in the major part of patients there was no assessment of patency performed at all uh, and i also include on the right hand side uh, here the uh, data because we did the same analysis within acst uh, where we uh, did so asymptomatic patients and it revealed almost the same almost Again, almost in half the patients with a procedural stroke, there was not an assessment of the treated artery. I think we can do better here. So what about the mechanism of stroke? And this is again, the, only the symptomatic patients, ICSS, very busy, small numbers. Uh, this shows you that indeed the, uh, the mechanisms are diverse, but with the blue arrows, I tried to point at the uh, uh, mechanisms that are hemodynamic in origin and yet you can see that a large part almost half the events in the surgical arm are due to hemodynamic events so it's no longer all thrombotic issues it's also hemodynamic and in the stenting arm when you count the numbers this is about one third of the events that are due to hemodynamic issues so in conclusion I think uh, procedural stroke dominates the outcomes of surgery and stenting that's that's pretty much clear now to all of us <clears throat> the mechanism of stroke of procedural stroke is quite diverse but we have several options to intervene 
um, uh, beforehand and to further lower the procedural stroke width in both surgery and stenting. And therefore, understanding this mechanism is still the main driver to perform technical improvements and further reduce the risk of procedural stroke. If there are any further questions on the bottom line, I put my email address and this is my final slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Geert. Um, just to make a quick reference to the guidelines. So does the guidelines give any reference to what to do if you have a procedural stroke? Do they recommend uh, imaging or uh, assessment of the vessel? No, there are no recommendations. And this is uh, quite a difficult topic. We are about to finish a Delphi uh, consensus on this, how to respond. Mm -hmm. Again, how to respond when you notice, for example, on monitoring that during surgery you have an adverse event or the other hand around one day after the procedure, the patient develops a stroke. What to do? First have imaging, go to the angio suite, go to the R, what to do? And the, the, the opinions are diverse, also depending on local logistics, but this is something there's, uh, there's no guidance yet. We yeah. try to do with this Delphi to provide some guidance. So we will certainly look forward to that. One thing that uh, was striking, although small numbers, uh, was that the incidence of hemorrhagic strokes seemed higher after surgery. Yep. Why is that? That's very interesting. We have not a clue in this in this series, <clears throat> but I I could think of again hemodynamic uh, causes there, and and a, uh, a, um, uh, as Henning also stated, the the intraoperative uh, issues with uh, hemodynamic uh, control, which may be more difficult during general surgery than on a local uh, surgery, reflecting also the risk for hyperfusion after the after the intervention but you know we do have some let's say at least partly historical data that tells us that the patients who are at high risk for developing hyperperfusion are those who are most severely compromised before the operation and these were randomized data so they you know theoretically they should have been equally distributed that's true but i guess this was small small numbers so it's 27 versus yeah. 56 strokes but uh and one in, in every ten. <clears throat> Henning. Gerd, thank you. I was a bit surprised that uh, so many patients suffered a, a perioperative stroke due to hemodynamic reasons. How, how was that defined? What does that mean? Is it an imaging issue from the CT afterwards? or uh, how, how did you define hemodynamic yeah. perioperative strokes? Yeah, that is of course very uh, relevant. Uh, the details are actually in the in the in the paper in uh, 2015 in our journal, European Journal, of course. Um, but it, it was quite well defined beforehand. Either uh, atrium flutters or uh, uh, hemodynamic depression with a, with a mean arterial blood pressure below a certain uh, pre-analysis um, uh, defined. Uh, uh, threshold. So we had quite some some serious and, and strictly defined uh, characterization of the hemodynamic compromise. Mm -hmm. Because I, this is of course crucial because mm -hmm. otherwise that will be the, uh, the point of discussion afterwards. Yeah. The other difference between having a stroke <coughs> after stenting and anorexomy seemed to be that the time interval from the procedure to the stroke occurring was longer after surgery. It, is there any speculation about that? Well, I think with the, all the control measures that we perform with surgery, we are able to, well, not completely, but mostly abandon the intra-procedural yeah. stroke. Um, so we're doing quite safe there. And then still in the post-operative phase, there are, there are strokes that occur. <clears throat> so it may turn out, but we do not have the characteristics that in some cases you may have uh, additional post-operative monitoring of the treated artery to prevent the post-operative strokes. In the stenting arm, most most events are on the day of the event, and and as discussed uh, previously, I think there is a need for uh, more intense monitoring um, when doing carotid stenting, both during the stenting and afterwards, both hemodynamic and status of the treated artery. Henning. Well, that brings me to a, a very interesting question here that was given by some of 
one of our viewers. Some people think that flow may be used to estimate risk of hyperperfusion, so also as a reason of <coughs> periprocedural stroke. Even use 10 minutes pause and remeasure and then lower the systolic pressure for the first night. Do you think it's unnecessary and that relates to my comment that flow me measurement is nothing that we really need? Uh, I think the, the viewer is, is right with that point, especially in patients with an uh, incomplete circle of Willis and a very high-grade internal stenosis might suffer from hyperperfusion due to the bad collateralization before. And uh, this can, he's right, measure sometimes that you have a flow in, uh, in the internal carotid artery of 500, 600, or even more mm. milliliters per minute, which is too high. And uh, thank you, thank you very much for um, correcting us, <laughs> because these are really the patients that, in whom the blood pressure has to be controlled. Uh, maybe these are the patients that had to be observed on, on an in intermediate care station or something yeah. like that. Whether TCD really helps, that was evaluated a couple of years ago. Um, I'm not sure because it doesn't work for every patient, but it's an, another option to control the flow in the, in the MCA. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you, you have to, to realize that hyperfusion may occur even weeks after the procedure. Uh, the case <laughs> okay. has been described at least days yeah. after. Most yeah. events yeah. occur on day three or four. Yeah. So it's not just me measuring the flow during the intervention or right after. We have the protocol now defined as two hours after the closure, after skin closure, and then the next morning again. And in the cases where you have a, a stable uh, level, you can safely discharge them. When you see an increase in flow, but below the absolute threshold, below 100 on the second measurement, we consider those at a special high risk for hyperfusion and we, we perform in those cases already a blood pressure, uh, a strict blood pressure mm -hmm. uh, protocol. And the ones that are above 100% increase already at the first measurement, those cases go immediately to the, uh, to the medium care ward. Will be presented at the ninth Munich Vascular Conference. It will be in Munich. Yeah. <laughs> I yes. read an abstract about that. <laughs> so I think that to, to have, a, to have a, the last uh, question, this is a really surgical one. Um, do we need to have neurologists to assess our patients afterwards uh, so we are sure that we're going to pick up all uh, procedural strokes? Or can we do it ourselves? Well, I think we can do it. But there are several studies that have shown that the rate of events when scored by neurologists is higher than when scored by a more complete, by an independent neuro stroke neurologist than by a surgeon or any interventionist. So if you want to have reliable data and data that other people around the world trust when you report them, it is, it is very nice in your methodology uh, and also for clinical outcome and for patients to have a a neurologist involved. There's one issue there that they are, um, at least in our center, very often immediately send the patients to the CT scanner when they, uh, even when there's uh, just a, a tiny septal uh, drop of one corner of the mouth, uh, when that's clearly, uh, for example, for a high lesion, yeah. a peripheral lesion. And, and you have to find a, a mix and, and, yeah. and act as a team again to define when do you make further steps. Okay, I think this brings us to the end of this, the first ESVS um, webinar. I hope you have in, uh, enjoyed it. And on behalf of uh, Henning Eckstein and uh, Gerd de Borst, we would like to thank you for participating. Um, we'll be back in November. Good night. <laughs>